Hello and welcome to Fast Thinking. My name is Jen Ellis and I'm a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative. On June 3rd, the Supreme Court struck down key tenants of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, otherwise known as the CFAA, in a decision called Van Buren versus United States. Though the CFAA was passed in the days of the floppy disk, it has broadly defined computer hacking in the United States ever since. However, even after multiple amendments, the law has faced persistent criticism and has been in desperate need of an update. So on this episode of Fast Thinking, we're asking, has the Supreme Court redefined computer hacking? And what are the broader implications of this decision? To unpack the court's decision, I'm joined by Trent Timer, non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center. So Trent, thank you for joining me. Can you kick us off by explaining like, what was the decision that the Supreme Court came out with? Absolutely, and thank you for having me. This is really interesting, and it's a, it's a, it's a big impact to 18 U.S.C. Uh, 1030, which is a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And what it does is it focuses in on the difference between unauthorized access to a computer system and exceeding authorized access. And this has really come down to it. And if you read the decision, it was a, a, a six, three split, the majority ruling that, which changed or struck down how we look at exceeding authorized access. So to back this up, let's lay the foundation. Unauthorized access to a computer system. You have a hacker breaks into a system in the United States that violates federally Title 18 USC 1030. And that means they didn't have authorization to use some, some artifice mechanism or manner to break into the system and get access to data, files, et cetera. Exceeding authorized access also comes down to somebody that's authorizing the system, a trusted person that had legitimate access to one part of the computer system that right. then uses it to go into another part of the system, which right. they don't have access. Now, here's the bottom line on this. The big debate by the court was, is misusing your authority for something that you can do day to day versus going into another part of the system you had no access. And that was the the, the issue in right. this case. Did the person exceed his authorized access or did he misuse his access? And that's where it brings us to it. And just, I mean, a very quick, like 30 second, the case was about, so it was, sure. it was pop, right? I'm gonna yeah, so it's a it was a Florida police sergeant that was in his patrol car, uh, was running license plates on his computer system, check him out, and yeah. basically got into a situation with another individual where he's getting paid to run the license plates. Little did he know that the FBI was investigating him and they gave him uh license plates that would prove that he was misusing right. his access to run right. the plates. He's right. getting paid to do it. He ran them, and then the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office charged him with exceeding authorized access. Right. And you, I mean, you yourself, you are a former FBI agent, right? You were yes, I retired, retired from the Bureau after 23 years. Actually, I spent most of my career using this statute. Right. And you probably worked on cases like this because I've heard of many cases like this. This is not unique, this case of, of um, what I guess you would call an abuse of authority, right? You have, you are authorized to access a system and you abuse it in some way to access information that is confidential, sensitive information. Um, and I want to make sure that as we talk about this, when we talk about the implications for security, we don't lose sight of the fact that like, there is there is a serious issue here about the abuse of trust and 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 the sort of insider threat uh, aspect of it, um, and so the the decision of the Supreme Court doesn't change the fact that like there was a serious abuse of trust here. Um, all right, so so this so the Supreme Court what did the, what was the decision? What did they say? Well, the Supreme Court held. Let me get the exact language. An individual exceeds authorized access when he accesses a computer with authorization, but obtains information located in particular areas of the computer, such as files, folders, or databases that are off limits to him. So literally, you're an insider in a position of trust, but you go into a part of the computer system, you didn't have authority to be there. Yeah. That is exceeds authorized access. And that's, and that's what they held. So that's what struck down this law. And so here in the United States, Congress is going to have to readdress this statute to clarify this part of the law. 
So, okay, so what they're saying is, they're saying you either have access, you either have authority to access it or you don't. And if you have authority to access in that situation, terms of service or contract isn't, doesn't constitute, like violating terms of service or a contract doesn't constitute violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Is that, is that about it? That's about it. So to give an example, so, and they use this in the, in the analysis is that if an individual working in a car rental agency and yeah. has access to the system, has access to the GPS locator, and uses that access to uh, inappropriately stock or try and uh, go after um, clients to find out when they are, where they, where they are, what they're doing, that's actually exceeding, it's not exceeding their access, they're just misusing the system. Right. So that's the difference versus right, right, literally right. going into a different part. And so like that, that's more of a, like a private issue, right? Like you, you have other avenues to pursue that rather than it being like a criminal issue. Right. I liked, there was a piece in their um, opinion or their decision um, that I really liked where they um, said, if terms of service violations alone qualify as an unauthorized act for computer crime purposes, then this is the quote, millions of otherwise law abiding citizens are criminals. Um, and what they're referencing is, you know, they're referencing situations where you have um, people who are using uh, their computer, their, their work issued computers, which they have the right to use because they were issued them by their company, but they're using them to like look up sports results or whatever. And, and like, they're not really meant to do that, but it's probably okay. And everybody kind of does that stuff. Right. So, um, so that's, that's what it, it said in the, in the ruling. It, it did. It, it really kind of uh, clarified what, what they call de minimis use. Like, yeah. you know, you're, sports scores, sending personal emails, buying something on, you know, a web store versus right. you, 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 you misused your system probably against company policy, government policy, but yeah. is that really a federal felony? And right. as where they defined it as you're going into another system and giving yourself say a 20% raise yeah. where yeah. you're, you're authorized to be on the system <laughs> and you give yourself a raise. Right. Right. Which is a whole other thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I, I work for a cybersecurity company and I've uh, spent a lot of time on the CFA um, in, in recent years looking at what the implications are for the CFA around security research, right? And, and independent, good faith security research um, uh, is, is sort of relatively chilled by the way that um, the CFA is written at the moment, uh, partly because of this, this concept of like, how do you determine what authorization looks like on the internet? Um, and you know, the, pro the problem we have is that I think in security, often if you talk to people in the security community, what they would say to you is, if you put something out on the internet and you make it publicly accessible, then authorization is implied. And I think asset owners would say, no, 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 that's not the case. We would, we would like to have something like terms of service or something that tells you whether or not you have authorization to access it. This ruling, this, the, the Van Buren uh, decision hasn't really addressed that issue, has it? Sort of sidestepped the, the issue in situations where authorization isn't clear. Right. So like what they've said is if you have authorization, then exceeding that is an, uh, uh, exceeding that over and above what's in terms of service or a contract isn't a violation. But they haven't said whether terms of service can be used to implicate, indicate whether you have authorization or not. Right. It's correct. It's it, it really kind of sidestepped it. It just really focused on you have to go into a part of the system you weren't authorized. It doesn't get into what we have, like the Millennium Digital Copyright Act here in the United States, right, right. where you're, you're getting into code and maybe changing it or yeah. you're going outside of terms of service. It, it didn't address that at all. Now, the one thing that it did bring up when I first heard about it and I first read it, and, and this was kind of the concern I had where I was more with the dissent, but I understand the the majority on this is that it really makes it more difficult to go after insiders. So as an FBI agent or somebody with the NCA yeah. in the UK, you know, basically somebody that was there and 
now you're really having to articulate the difference. It's yeah. how did they exceed authorized access? How do you prove that they exceeded it? And it, yeah. it makes the insider threat thing much more difficult to, to investigate. Yeah, so I mean, I, I completely agree with you. So this is where it seems like Congress might need to to get their thinking caps on and take another look at the CFA and see if there's a way of sort of addressing that particular issue. Because the insider threat is a real threat and it is something that people should definitely be mindful of and, and, and cautious about. Um, so I think the net of it is it hasn't really particularly clarified the situation for researchers. Um, uh, no. which are a lot of the people I know who ask about this. Um, it has clarified the situation when it comes to when you already have access uh, authorized um, and uh, and it sort of cleaned that up a little bit so that you, you, know, you either have authorization or you don't. Um, and we need more, more focus and more scrutiny on the insider threat piece. Um, Trent, thank you so much for joining me today and chatting through all of this and helping educate me on this stuff. Really appreciate it. And for everyone who's listening, thank you very much for joining us. Um, check out the next episode of Fast Thinking. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>